two steps in this orthogonal space um, because of this funny feature of these uh, anti-commuting numbers. So there's really one partner for every particle that we know and love. They have silly names because these things were invented in the 70s. So the partner of the electron is the selectron. The partner of the photon is called the photino, and so on. Now, let me tell you how this solves, how, how this solves the problems. Um, ah, but I also, the, th this is the picture of supersymmetry was an exact symmetry of the world. It isn't an exact symmetry of the world, otherwise we would have seen all these guys uh, already. But again, like everything else that we've seen, uh, it really looks like the long distance world has some accidental differences between, uh, that, are, that are obscuring the fundamental similarity between, uh, between the interactions. We saw it already in going, seeing how the standard model worked, all these, um, all these different interactions, these stick figures that said that all the different forces were basically the same. That fact only became apparent at short enough distances when, when trivialities like the masses of these particles, um, the, or the difference between the mass of these particles could be neglected. Um, the, those things are trivialities from the short distance point of view. Of course, they're everything from the long distance point of view. But anyway, at, su at sufficiently short distances, this should be the picture. But in order to see these quantum dimensions are there, you've got to go to some sufficiently short scale. So let's say that sufficiently short scale is 10 to the minus 17 centimeters. Okay, this is not a random distance. Uh, um, this is associated, well, remember, this is the, uh, the weak length we're talking about. But imagine it's any, any scale you like. Um, let's just call it uh, 10 to the minus 17 here. At long, at long distances, you don't see the quantum dimension. You see these big fluctuations. Great. But then when the size of this box gets small enough that you see the quantum dimension, something new has got to happen. Something pr uh, perhaps I didn't emphasize is that there's supposed to be some complete symmetry. Uh, the reason this is called the, uh, th this is a symmetry between uh, ordinary space and, these, uh, and, and quantum dimensions of space. Uh, um, well, th there's supposed to be a complete symmetry between them. So uh, that means that anything that's, happening, anything that's happening in the ordinary dimension should also be happening in the quantum dimensions. But that means that you can't have huge fluctuations in the ordinary dimensions. Huge fluctuations in the ordinary dimensions would have to be accompanied by big fluctuations up and down in the quantum dimensions. But that's impossible, because you can't take more than one step in the quantum dimension. Okay? So that basic fact tells you the only, way this, uh, the only way this can be consistent is, in fact, if there's no fluctuations at all, or if these very big fluctuations are simply removed as you make the box smaller and smaller. That's exactly what happens. In fact, this argument is correct, and it does remove these very violent fluctuations of the vacuum. Now, uh, in order for this to solve any of our problems, it has to happen early enough. It has to, uh, I I if we saw these quantum dimensions at 10 to the minus 29 centimeters, it wouldn't make any difference. Uh, it wouldn't help us understand why, uh, why when the electron moves through space, it, 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 can, it, it bangs into this condensate every 10 to the minus 17 centimeters. We would still wonder why there aren't huge fluctuations down to 10 to the minus 29 centimeters. For this very big idea to solve our problem, these, this quantum dimension should be showing up right around the corner. So it's not our desire to make life exciting that says that we should see this showing up right around the corner. If it's to give this big answer to this problem, at least a partial answer to the problem, why there's a macroscopic universe, then this has to show up next door. So let me just end by telling you how we would see these things uh, at, uh, uh, in uh, experiments. So um, here is an aerial picture right outside uh, Geneva. Those are the uh, Swiss-French Alps in the background. And of course, you don't see this red ring uh, um, from the sky, but, uh, but uh, 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 deep underground beneath where this 28-kilometer uh, circumference, 27-kilometer circumference ring is, is a beam. And around that beam, um, we accelerate protons going around one direction. Uh, and going around the other direction uh, at extremely large energies, around 1,000 times the rest mass of the, uh, uh, 10,000 times the rest mass of the, um, of the uh, protons. And they're then made to collide with each other at a couple of places around the ring. Uh, and those collisions probe physics at these distances, around 10 to the minus 17 centimeters. So here's a cartoon for what's happening. Here's a proton and another proton. Um, and again, they're accelerated to uh, uh, seven nines there times the speed of light, each one of them. Um, 
they smash into each other, and by making them go that fast, again, by the uncertainty principle, we need a lot of energy to probe very short distances. So that's why we've got to accelerate them so fast. Uh, they, they probe distances around 10 to the minus 17 centimeters, and hopefully something new happens. Um, something new happens means that we're going to produce some particles and things that we, that we haven't seen before. Now, these particles that are produced uh, don't come out wearing name tags saying, I'm something new. In fact, they typically decay uh, very, very rapidly to ordinary particles. The time scale for the decay is around 10 to the minus 27 seconds. That's how long it takes light to travel this distance of 10 to the minus 17 centimeters. And they decay into ordinary particles, electrons, muons, anti-electrons, uh, quarks. We don't see quarks in isolation, but we see large jets of particles uh, coming out associated with them. Uh, and really what's going on isn't the actual protons hitting each other, but if we look inside the proton, we see that it's made out of a, a bunch of quarks and gluons, and it's just a messy bag, around 10 to the minus 14 centimeter big, made out of quarks and gluons. What we're interested in is the head-on interactions between these quarks and gluons with each other. The vast majority of these times, these protons just rip each other to shreds, and nothing interesting happens. But, uh, but sometimes we have some very strong interactions and uh, um, head-on interactions and things, things come out. Right. And the things that are come out are observed in these gigantic detectors uh, that surround the collision regions. Um, uh, the reason the detectors have to be so big is the particles are coming out very, very fast. And you just have to stop them. Just stopping them forces, uh, uh, is, is a large part of what makes these uh, uh, detectors so gigantic. So I'll, I'll just, uh, just take a couple of minutes to tell you how this would show up uh, at the uh, LHC. So let's say we take these two protons, we smack them into each other, uh, and at high enough energies, uh, we might be able to pop, them, pop some of the quarks off in there and make them move in the quantum dimensions. So they would look like we're producing these superpartners of the quarks, these squarks. But again, they don't uh, come out telling us I'm a squark. They very rapidly decay. So this squark might decay to an ordinary quark and the superpartner of a photon, the photino. This squark can do something more, more complicated, um, has, uh, suffer a more complicated chain of decays. And what we end up seeing in these detectors are these visible particles in red, or things that go out, whiz out really, really fast, are captured by the detectors and we see them. Uh, and we try to infer from the pattern of what came out uh, that this is indeed what was going on. Now there's something very notable here. These photinos uh, are, just like the photon, have no charge. They're, relatively speaking, much, much more massive, but they're very feebly interacting with the, with the detector. They don't stop in the detector. They completely escape. And you would notice that they completely escape just because you would see there's some energy and momentum missing from the event. Now, that's very interesting, uh, but I don't have time to talk about it. But uh, from a completely different side of our field, uh, at very, very large distances uh, in the universe, there's evidence for the need of some dark matter that makes up most of the mass in the universe. And if you ask the cosmologist what it would take uh, if you were to synthesize this dark matter in the Big Bang, what properties would it have to have in order for it to work um, in the most conservative way? Then they would say you need some particle that's neutral, its mass is around hundreds of times the mass of the proton. In other words, particles almost identical in properties to the photino that we're just talking about. And that's not something that's being put into this theory. It's really, it's really, it's, it's a natural prediction. Uh, that, uh, that you would have these stable particles lying around that could well constitute the dark matter of the universe. And if that's the case, there's a whole suite of experiments over the, over the next uh, decade that are going to be looking for dark matter directly, in deep underground caverns, indirectly looking for signals that they might be out there in the galaxy, they can annihilate with each other, they could give rise to very high energy uh, photons, uh, antiparticles, and so on. But one, th one way, very directly, is we could actually just make it at the LHC. The LHC could well be a dark matter factory. And if it was the Photino, it would be poetic because the dark matter would actually be light moving in the quantum dimension. <laughs> so uh, finally, um, how will we actually know? This is, a, uh, this is a cartoon that any experimentalist in the audience would kill me. Uh, for, uh, for, uh, for, for presenting, but this is very roughly how we're going to find out uh, what's, uh, what's going on at the LHC. Um, there's a whole suite 
any, any process, we're, we're colliding particles uh, together, very high energy particles are coming out, and most of the time what happens is just standard, good old known physics. It's just known physics is perfectly, perfectly, in principle, well understood. It's not, in principle, what we're interested in, but it completely dominates what actually happens. Um, but the reason we have any prayer is that these new particles that we're making uh, have relatively high energies, have high masses. And the rates for, for standard processes fall with energy, but the rates for making these new particles will have some characteristic mass scale associated with them. So very roughly, you would start looking for blips above this big background of known physics at high enough energies. Just to give you an idea of the amount of a needle in the haystack, uh, which is involved with this, the rates uh, are, are, are as follows. There's roughly a billion collisions per second. Okay? That's roughly a billion collisions per, uh, per second at, at the LHC. Um, roughly 10 top quarks a second are going to be produced. Um, this is remarkable because the top quark, 14 of them were discovered in 1995 at Fermilab after seven years of running. Okay, and the previous generation of experiment, uh, its entire purpose in life was to, one of its entire purposes in life was to discover this particle. It did so after seven years. 14 of them was enough uh, to qualify for a discovery. Now we're going to be making them 10 times a second. So that's the, the maximum in experimental particle physics is yesterday's discovery is, uh, is, uh, is today's background, is tomorrow's calibration. So, um, uh, so anyway. Um, and on the other hand, the kind of these super partners, this kind of, this sort of physics, I mean, if there, if there are squarks out there where they should be, we'll be making about once a minute. Um, so that's a nice human time scale. It's a reasonable rate to be making them. But you have to compare it to these gigantic numbers. So this is how well you have to understand all of this to be able to dig these things out. It's a real, uh, it's a challenging and very interesting needle in a haystack problem. Um, but of course, uh, people have been thinking about it for a long time. So anyway, uh, uh, let me just uh, end um, by saying that uh, you should really st stay tuned. We, we really are making steady progress at, on at least some of the, the deep theoretical questions. And very excitingly, uh, we are now in the epoch where there's a real chance that we'll get a lot of uh, new data that might uh, 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 guide our search. And it's really an amazing time for doing physics. Thanks a lot. <laughs>